James, welcome. So good to be with you. And I'm so glad. Welcome to our Tuesday um, sit. And uh, I have Phoenix with us um, and she's we got a squeaky ball in her mouth. So I'll usher her out at some point. But <laughs> if you hear that, that's what's going on. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to be diving or exploring this terrain of um, peace and particularly through a dharmic lens and um, especially exploring uh, this idea of protecting our peace, um, which introduces uh, that peace can be a practice and one that's not necessarily easy, <laughs> hence, um, hence uh, the, the reason that we, we want to keep it in the forefront and that there's ways we can protect it. And so um, welcome, welcome. We'll spend about the first half of our time together today exploring some of the teachings and then uh, we'll sit together. So we'll have a meditation and a, a sit. Um, and it's about half and half. We'll go until about 55 minutes, please, if you can. Um, really, you know, if you're here, really be here. Um, even if you're if you're off camera, um, just you know, really being here, um, just like we would be if we came together for a sangha in person. When it, you know, it's like the phones are away. We're not checking emails. We're not um, pinging to um, other things. <laughs> we're giving ourselves the uh, rare and radical benefit in these times of. Um, one pointed attention and just receiving what it is that you're here to receive and sensing um, a value to uh, not multitasking. You know, just to kind of sense what that's like as we, uh, we cultivate a continuity of just like being here together and that's all we're doing. Um, there's a value to that that we often notice. So with that, let's take a moment to um, check in with ourselves and, and sense into our intention. So if you want to close your eyes, you can, or you keep them open, whatever your practice is. And we're drawing our awareness inward, feeling into our bodies, because this question of, you know, how is it for us can't really be answered if we're not tuning into our bodies. So sensing being in our bodies as um, something we touch in on here um, right now, but then it's a, a, a can, you can continue it through the length of our time together. Sensing what it's like to hear my words while you're in your body, all the way in your body, like even in your feet and your hands. Come all the way in. You can soften your skin. You can soften your chest from the inside. And just checking in as you soften your chest from the inside with, you know, um, yeah, how's the terrain of the body right now? What sensations are prominent? What emotions are prominent? And we're just noticing, we're starting to incline towards mindfulness together. We're less concerned about what we're noticing and sort of turning towards being more interested in awareness itself, noticing if we're feeling at ease or restless or something else, but without kind of making it right or wrong. It's just noticing, oh, this is how it is for me today. And then from there, like, what is the intention? What is it that you're most wanting to feel or receive? And allow the question to be an inquiry. So I ask the question and then the response arises. Maybe the desire for peace 
or maybe there's something else, connection, community, belonging, self-love, whatever's arising, allowing it to fold into your practice and our collective practice. May our, uh, the rest of our time together today um, serve to guide you towards um, a depth of awakening That is a deeper knowing of your inherent value, enoughness, worthiness, and um, birthright of peace. We can bring our palms together. And as we open our eyes, we can just um, like kind of take the, the room in. Because part of taking our bodies into consideration is taking our nervous system into consideration. And so we just notice like, okay, the relative like um, pleasantness or relative safety of the room and then we orient to each other. Yeah. And then we include, what's it like to come into community together? It's always different. So we just kind of sense into that. And then if you would put your um, intention in the chat. Thank you, Candice. My intention is to sit myself in love. Thank you. Yeah, who else? Come in. Who else wants to we'll put their intention? Looking for calm and ease and challenging times. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. It's a lot. It's good to just say that. I think that's like the first part. You know, it's like, it's like just the acknowledgement, right? It's like, yeah, that this is a lot. Mm. Um, yeah, I love Candace's intention, clarity. Thanks, Marlene. To explore what it means to have peace, what gets in the way. Thank you. Yes, Ruth, Karen, looking to feel peace, clarity, and connection. Awesome. So there's this recognition that part of our practice is in um, this acknowledging of what it is that our hearts desire not making that wrong, but actually tuning into it. It's a wonderful thing, this longing. And knowing it, knowing our intention, strengthens our practice. And it's important to name that we don't, um, it can get sticky, right? Because we name it and then we might start to attach to it and start to judge our own experience in relationship to that intention, right? And just be like, oh, I'm not doing this right or it'll never happen or whatever. No, we let go of that. And we just tune into the listening of the heart and we sense that there's something um, wholesome just about that. Tara Brock says that as we acknowledge the longing, we bridge the gap from longing to belonging. And part of that is in us, I think probably, and I would say like us Westerners, especially who tend to be very hyper-focused on outcome, on result on getting things to be peaceful, on getting things to be happy, even certainty. But when I say Western, I mean like, you know, a lot of like stuff, right? We're, we're very conditioned, I'm gonna speak more about this in a moment, to um, hitch uh, our sense of, you know, okayness, enoughness, peace, which is tied to both of those things, on um, uh, getting things attaining. We're very, very, very uh, addicted and attached, all of us, me included, because it's sort of been the soup we've been swimming in, so to speak. Um, we've been very sort of like, um, I mean, the soup we've been swimming in, that's sort of like, you know, 
anyway, I could speak a lot about that, but let me stay on topic. Um, but the soup we've been swimming in is this, uh, this misunderstanding that causes us a lot of pain that how it is right now in this moment somehow isn't okay and we're not okay in that. We either don't have enough money, education, happiness, wealth, insight, whatever, fill in the blank. We don't have enough of something. And there's the sense that there's a lacking of something, right? That we live with through that, which is suffering. If we don't see that, then we start to try to solve the problem, right? In, in the wrong ways. Um, because at this point in the game, all of us here, right? The jig is up. You know, we've lived enough life to know that if there was something to get that would um, take us to this place of being perfect and having a perfect, ex uh, perfect, experience and we all have ideas of what that is of living and being in this moment you know it's like we would have already discovered it life is so loving in the way that it doesn't give us a lie right it's constantly teaching us that like um this is sort of you know it's like it's like it's 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 showing us what it is all the time through the arising of what we call this moment and um, which can't be separated from what we taste, touch, smell, see, think. Everything we sense is this moment is part of that. And so um, our practice, realizing the jig is up, with wisdom, like with wisdom, experience and wisdom comes this, okay, well, that actually doesn't work. And in my experience, this is continual. It's important that we um, remember this is not a noun. There is nowhere to get. And, ex and any time we try to try to make it solid, make it something, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're off to the races, so to speak. We're, we're caught in that, that uh, delusion of, um, you know, I can make life something that pleases me all the time or something that's pleasing all the time, even by worrying about it, you know. Um, so we take the backward step and everything that I'm going to say, you know, um, about peace and the cultivation of it and its opposite anxiety, because I can't talk about peace, right, without talking about anxiety, um, will revolve around unhooking from this tendency that we have moment it's like kind of a moment by moment thing the only way that we really can notice it or see it is by like sitting meditation which is why we sit together we eliminate all the distractions that so we can see there is a subtle way um it, it, that that, that uh, feeds our anxiety of like you know just mm, ever so slightly being on edge sort of tending to our self-improvement project in the background it's so subtle. We do it even in the ways that we wait for the next moment or we anticipate what's coming. And I'm just naming it like this. Hopefully, you know, for those of us who've been practicing a while, like there's a way in which you're like, you, you know yourself enough to go, oh, that, I know that. Because it's in the understanding of these kinds of things that we free ourselves from them. And when I say free our, my, ourselves from them, we don't get rid of them. We just don't. And part of our freedom lies in getting that. As human beings, we will experience anxiety. We will experience um, emotions that are big, feelings that are big. We will experience things in our life that are hard, that we don't like, that we'd rather not be so. The kicker is until we get that, we won't notice fully all of the ways that we're blessed by life. Like, all of the things that happen in a day that are just kind of like, wow. 
right? Could just make your heart kind of just, you know what I mean? These moments of like, oh, this is why I'm alive. We don't get like that, those wonderful moments. We don't get those if we're not um, seeing clearly uh, the, the ways that we uh, try to prevent other moments from happening. All right, let me just, I wanna look at my notes here. I wanted to mention, because I hear we are talking about protecting our peace, and why does it need to be protected? Notice when I say protected, we're, we're inferring that it's something you already have, something that you already are. <laughs> I don't so much like the word protecting in the sense that it's like kind of when, I, when we think about it, we might think about it the way we harden or shield. But I do like it in the sense that it, it, it reminds us that it's sort of a conscious thing. That it's um, it's it's a it's an it's in some way there's an intention behind it, you know. That peace is something that if I'm not intentional about it, then um, and I'm not kind of remembering it through my practice. If I'm not prioritizing my well, and I don't mean this in like some kind of like lame way, like it's such a you know, protecting our peace, like, wow, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm trying to say here in terms of, uh, but it, it's like prioritizing our well-being, but I don't mean that in sort of the flip, flippant way it's talked about in the wellness industry these days. Um, it's a deep practice protecting our well-being or allowing our well-being to be a priority. And when I say our well-being, I mean we take into consideration our interdependence. As long as other beings are suffering, I'm really clear, I can't be fully liberated, right? Like, and this is where patience comes into practice. <laughs> In this lifetime, right? Will all beings be liberated? I don't know, you know? So it's like, we just practice one step in front of the other. So this is by Judy Leaf, and she wrote a great piece in, um, lion's roar or it might have been tricycle no it was tricycle about anxiety and practice and so um uh, there's a lot that i took from that reading and what i'm saying today um but she said this may sound strange but when anxiety builds i talk with it <laughs> i say to my anxiety remember like protecting our pieces of practice what will happen will happen I will fail or I will succeed. Now listen to this. This is very honest inner self-talk. What will happen will happen. I will fail or I will succeed. Things will work out or they will not. In the meantime, will my worry or anxiety change anything? No. Will it help in any way? No. My anxiety won't make a bit of difference, um, except my anxiety won't make a bit of difference, except for making me suffer for no reason. I don't try to avoid what I'm feeling, but I try to put it in its place. And Judy, she speaks a lot of wisdom in this because the typical instruction is like we try to hedge our bets we try to force the mind into believing what we want to happen will and it's a fool's game if it worked i would be i would be doing it like honestly like i want things to happen the way that i want them to happen too but if we if we think our peace and i want to differentiate between essential peace and wobbly peace. <laughs> Our essential peace is unconditional. And our practice is, is, is the true like freedom of the heart because the heart that isn't constantly guarding and trying to prepare and yearning for a place where everything's going to work out the way that I want it to, the place where I will quote unquote succeed. 
then um, we'll be really wound up and not know why, right? It's like, I, so I just, I can't emphasize enough how wise her words are. What she's using dialogue and talking to herself here to strengthen is, um, is, is she's really addressing the feeling itself and I'm going to let's, and we'll talk more how, about anxiety and dissecting it. But this is not about you or me, like cheerleading ourselves on to be like, it's all going to work out the way you want it. It really will be okay. Cause that actually does on a very like subtle level, create um, a, more anxiety. Cause there's a part of the mind that knows that's bullshit. There's a part of us that knows that you know, things happen and, and there's a lot of causes and conditions besides me that are creating it. So despite my wishes, despite what I really deeply want, if it's external now, deeply wanting inner peace, that's good. That's a wholesome aspiration, but we have to get that. It doesn't come from hitching it on things being the way I want them to. And this is a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> It's a tough pill to swallow because our conditioning is such, this is wobbly piece. If you get this car, then it'll be good. I mean, our consumer culture is very much based on the take this pill and you won't feel so crappy all the time, right? Oh, all the things you've tried up to now haven't worked, but this is, I mean, it happens in spirituality all the time. Your thing that you've been doing you know, you're still not feeling like 100% blissed out 100% of the time. So, but this will do it. And we go for it, right? And in those, and then in the moments of going for it, and it's like so blameless. Of course, the intention is wholesome and innocent. We just want to feel good. And we can a lot more often than we probably do, <laughs> but we have to bark up the right tree, so to speak. We have to drink from the true well, which always comes back to this body and seeing clearly the root problem, the fundamental anxiety of being human and not being able to know for sure how it's all going to go. The fundamental anxiety, Ezra Beta called it um, uh, the angst, uh, existential angst or angst. I mean, they were talking about it, right? The existentialists, right? And, and I think like, it's like this angst and how we work with it, or I don't know how you maybe say it some other way, but um, everything hinges on this. And we can see that there's this anxiety that comes from not being able to know how it's all going, but that's not the suffering. The suffering comes when we make that wrong, right? The suffering comes when we make that wrong. When we think I just shouldn't feel this way. Now, you know, so we, there is this little, I mean, without a little tension in our lives, we need anxiety. We need a certain amount of tension, right? It's the stuff of life in some ways, you know, I mean, there's certain anxieties that are inherent and important for our survival, but we all know that humans, we are so good at, um, at like binding ourselves up, being almost weirded out in the moments that it's absent. That's why I like, you know, it was like, that's why, you know, drinking, like when I used to drink alcohol, it was like, that was part of, part of it was like, oh, I could be at ease, but I didn't have to deal with that nagging sense that I should be doing something else or something like that. Like any moment that I wasn't proving my okayness, even through constant and habitual thinking, I was like, um, it, like, it just felt weird. I hadn't, you know, and that's where practice really saved me because it taught me, like, it, I was like, oh, like, I could be still and learn to just be with my experience. And that actually was like 
what I was hungry for. And then I ceased for, and again, it's a verb, right? Because I go through, it's like, we come and go with this. And then I ceased being interested in things like, you know, like I, I got, I was interested that I got that I didn't need certain things to be happy. And that included other people's approval, like a real loosening of that. And I was like, wow, like, <laughs> what is going on here? Oh, okay. This is a different way of, of, um, of approaching the search. And it's an also, it's like, we can really have confidence that this piece that we yearn for, this piece that we long for, it's not a red herring. And because the conventional, you know, the, the Buddha called it the stream, you know, and he said, our practices are against the stream because the stream is you're not good enough as you are. The stream is you have to worry endlessly about what could happen. You have to always be reaching and struggling for that success all the time without end because how you are and how it is, is not enough. Our essential peace doesn't come from anything really working out the way we want it to. It's like before that. And so we can really soften into our bodies right now as we lean into now, like, okay, so given we understand a little bit more or understand a little bit as, as much as we need to today, um, the problem, You've heard it before, but it's like, we have to revisit it because we get confused. We start to think very subtly that, no, it should be different. I should be different. It should be different. And if we're not honest about how it actually is, we create an unspoken war that actually creates us from responding to our lives, right? The way that that they're asking us to respond, you know, in the moment at hand, because we're too caught up in our day. We're too caught up in our, like the, 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 uh, um, what do you call it? The, um, the look forward, there's a word for it, but the trajectory of our success. Or am I going to get there? And, and then that, that's actually suffering that our peace is possible here and now. So one of the ways that we, you know, dislodge anxiety is I just wrote one line, hello, anxiety, you're not helping. It's to sense that subtle feeling in the body that comes over us. Um, and I would say to normalize some, a certain level of it. We don't wanna be all like, like, um, in a deep relaxation all day long. Like that's not fun, nor is it helpful or useful, or it's just a sliver of our human experience. So we're, we're renegotiating our relationship to our body's feeling charge, to our body sometimes feeling a little excited. Now too much excitement doesn't feel good either. And excitement and anxiety are the same sensationally in our bodies. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's like approaching and not just approaching, but prioritizing um, states of being in our body that are neither totally relaxed nor totally hyped up, right? It's, you know, our, our, um, you know, especially in with, with the way we are with technology, because we're, we, we're, what we're doing is we're increasing our toleration to stimulation. And we think that being really stimulated is the way to happiness. And then we need more and more of it, right? And then that's like dopamine. That's like a really big problem you know, in our culture right now. And so 
there is some amount of like, you know, dis not even disease, it's just energy in the body that if we didn't make so wrong through thinking about it or being opposed to it or not feeling it or whatever, because we believe it shouldn't feel this way, um, we could use to energize a lot of different pursuits and passions we have in our life. Um, this is from Ann Cushman, who is a uh, yogi who uh, applies mindfulness and the Dharma in ways that I really appreciate. She said, when focused in the body, this kind of concentration is not a mental effort, but an intensification of a felt sense of presence. In meditation, concentration works hand in hand with mindfulness. So part of dislodging anxiety is getting that the unsupervised thinking mind is programmed to go off into what could go wrong. It's called the negativity bias. Notice I said unsupervised. The unsupervised thinking mind is to be worked with as a continual practice. This isn't something that I put down, though I forget it a lot. But I'm, I'm, I'm devoted to picking it back up. What is my mind doing? And not attaching you know, not being so drawn towards its catastrophizing. Supervising the mind is enough to prevent you and us and me from spiraling into it. It's impossible to supervise the thinking mind in any way. I, without some meditation, like, I don't know how you can even see your thoughts if you're doing other things. Like, Sitting gives us an opportunity to see thinking, and that in and of itself is highly helpful. That's mindfulness of thinking. Breath. What do you pay attention to if you're not paying attention to all of the narratives, all of the dramas, all of how it could go wrong or right? We give our attention to things like our breath and into our bodies. There's a part of us that knows that slowing down is good. But what about slowing down as a practice? Slowing down your steps as you walk through your house or your workplace or the street. Not slowing down your steps because you're thinking about other things, but mindfully, like being in your body, just slowing down your steps, slowing everything way down and feeling things that when you're on your deathbed, if you're so lucky or not, I don't know if that's good or bad to have, you know, this awareness before death, you'll have regret, you'll like God, I wish I wasn't just there for every single bit of it. This is dislodging anxiety, being in the body and recognizing the preciousness of it because it's not going to be like this for very long. It's going like that. Has anyone noticed? Like as soon as you, it's gone. Life is unconditionally loving in that way. It doesn't hold anything against you subtly grossly it does like that's like you know that's physics right like if you um do something it will have a it will it will have a reaction but the way we regret and stay in the regret and the way we stay tied and bound to our guilt it's a mental process that is deeply tied to anxiety that can be dislodged through practice. Not, not, it's simple, but it's not easy. It takes intention and that's why we gather together in Sangha. The last thing I wanna mention and then we're gonna to sit together is we get to get cozy with uncertainty rather than preparing for later. We throw ourselves into this moment. We're consciously not preparing for later. I, I just, that's a practice in and of itself, not preparing for later. We get clear about how we do that and we don't do it. And we, you know, we practice in our meditation. 
So let's do that together now. This juncture, make yourself comfortable. You know, find your meditation posture. If you're on a chair, you know, feet on the floor, cry, legs uncrossed. Um, your donations really make a difference. Everyone is welcome to these uh, sits. And um, regardless of your capacity to uh, make a, a monetary offering, those of you, if you can, I greatly appreciate it. And um, you can do that via Zelle, Venmo, or PayPal. Um, also, I want to mention if you are um, going to be in Southern California or you already live here, <laughs> and um, you wanted to uh, come sit with me um, in person. I'm having a insight day long meditation retreat at my home. Um, the link and information for that is on my website at karinanickerson.com. A space is very limited. Um, so if you are, I believe I have um, five spots left. If you want to join that, um, how to do that is, uh, on my website, karinanickerson.com. Okay, let's, uh, spend some minutes. We're just gonna spend some minutes sort of letting awareness saddle and sink. And this is aided by really um, placing awareness on something like the breath, the feeling of it in and out. Just letting everything get really simple. Just in and out. You don't have to make sense of anything. Just be with, you know, just, just inhale, exhale. There's sort of not knowing, you know, as we lean into that. And that's right. Stay with that. This ease of not knowing just at being with the breath, not figuring it all out.
We don't experience breathing as separate from being in the body. Including now more of the, the felt sense of your body breathing. being subtly attuned to how that feels. The body starts to kind of tighten up, we notice that and re relax. Re relax, sort of back into this body of ease. The body breathing. There may be tension patterns in the body that don't relax so easily. We sense them. We're with them. We include them in the sense of the body breathing. However you're feeling, your body breathing, whether it's the subtlest hint at the tip of the nose or sort of this rise and fall across the front, your body, or if it's like in your belly, rising and falling. For me, it's like the sense of, of being in my body and then sensing the way it's expanded, sort of buoyed and lifted on the inhale and kind of settles on the exhale. And this is all without me influencing my breath. However it is for you, you can rest with that. Tending to the million things right and the million things wrong. They're getting lost in an image or an impression. This isn't helpful right now. Just really relax. You notice you start getting narrowed, you start getting in some way sucked in. To some remembering plan image. You can use that feeling in the body to just re relax back into sort of this body breathing, trusting, resting in this imperfect peace.
can continue in this way if you'd like to just um, spend the rest of our time here in meditation, just sitting, developing, uh, you know, just sitting in silence, in which case you can um, turn down the volume. or just not uh, go with my guidance and stay with your own practice. Caring about our experience, you know, caring is something that I train myself, continue to train myself to do. And we know um, the Buddha had teachings specifically for the training of what he called the four immeasurables, compassion, joy, equanimity, And so we incline towards that that sense of uh, peace as practice by leaning into, in some ways, these immeasurables as a practice of embodiment, first by just placing our hand on our chest. And then being curious about what that's like. As you apply the medicine of compassionate touch to anything that you might be anxious or anything, any anxiety that you might be feeling in your body right now, or anything that you might be subtly or not so subtly anxious about. You don't even have to crystallize into what it's about. We can just start with this, you know, um, care towards any um, way we are experiencing it in our bodies right now. And however this is arising for you, it's just caring about how this is, trusting that you're doing it right. And then sometimes I tune in to the flavor or the medicine, you know, um, the flavor of medicine, I guess, <laughs> I have a little kids, a lot of their medicine is flavored, um, that, uh, you know, I'm meeting in the arena of like uh, self-love, being there for myself. Sometimes it's care. Sometimes it's just like to be kind, to be caring, to be gentle. Other times it's to be... Um, like uh, encouraging, like, oh yeah, you can do this. I love you. You're so strong, you can do anything. Don't worry, you, you'll totally be able to handle that. Is there anything like that you, we could do now that would even make it, you know, even better if we have the time, you know, it's like that sort of, so it's, it's kind of like playing, I'm gonna give us uh, some moments in silence to sort of play with that inner tone and maybe saying anything to yourself that um, would influence, would, um, would feel good. I love you, 
Good job. I care. You can do anything. Safe to rest. I love you. This is workable. And then just, you know, um, when you sense it's time to let that go, coming back to just resting here and now, inside of this imperfect piece. As we uh, close together, I just wanted to leave you with this um, as well that I found really helpful, but I didn't want to not mention from Judy Leaf is encouragement, like for us as we practice today. Imagine the possibility of today being different than it otherwise would have been because of our intention sensing that our coming together today in this way is strengthening that intention. Believe that. And this is from Judy. The fact is that anxiety is an ineffective way of dealing with life's uncertainties and harshness. We should be anxious up to a point. If we didn't worry about the possibility of very real disasters, that would be stupid. But once something has got our attention, our anxiety gets in the way. It doesn't help us find ways to prevent such disasters, and it doesn't help us figure out how to deal with matters we cannot fix. The Indian master Shanti Deva advised a clean and simple approach. If you face a problem, you can do something about it. If you pay, face a problem you can do something about, do it. Why worry? And if there is nothing you can do about it, so be it. Why worry? Emotions like anxiety have two sides. They are messengers. They have something to teach us, but they quickly gather strength and take us over and we lose it. All right, so I love to ask you as we're, um, as we're leaving our Sangha, um, what is a takeaway from our, our sit together? Um, this will be on YouTube in the next few days. Um, if you found it of benefit, it's probably a good idea to watch it again and to sit again, regardless of where you, whether you, there's a bunch on there too, to support your practice. They're freely offered, so subscribe <laughs> so that you know when they get dialed in and you know when they come in. Um, uh, what was I going to say? To support your own practice. I can't encourage us all enough. I include myself in this to make this practice of insight, of mindfulness, um, to get that it is a practice, not to be surprised by that continually. And then, you know, and I laugh at myself too, because it does surprise me too seriously. <laughs> it's 
still. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then to really like, and to practice, to sit every day, even just five minutes a day, does something. We know this through science, through research. This is not, you know, baloney. Um, we sense in our bodies that this is helpful, but we have a lot of empirical data to back it up. Uh, thanks, Marlene. Essential peace exists regardless of circumstance. It comes before all else. I love that. The coming before all else is, that's a very deep insight. Thank you, Marlene. I love how you're using, or we can think about essential peace and wobbly peace, right? And the wobbly peace is what we think we want this peace that comes and goes, but it's not true peace. Essential peace comes before all else. Anyone else, please feel free to leave a donation. Really makes a difference, helps me continue to come here and, um, and do this for us. So thank you, thank you. Come to the Insight Day Long if you're around on June 5th um, and you can get information about that on my website. Um, if you'd like me to zoom you in, uh, you can email me and we'll talk about that. It's not as uh, the investment isn't as much um, if you do that. No one else popping in the chat. You're welcome, Michelle. You're welcome. All right. And um, we'll offer the blessings of Met to come back on Tuesday. You know, we meet every Tuesday. Um, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be well, may you feel safe and free from inner and outer harm, and may you have a feeling, may we have a feeling of well-being that isn't bound by circumstances or conditions.